All right, welcome to the MindWorks Podcast with Dre and Kev. Welcome Today we're back. doing episode number two in Case by Case. So we're going to be going through more teenage issues as something that we definitely work with as mental health professionals. Uh, so basically today's case is a teen struggle with defiant behavior. So let's go through it. The background of this case is basically that it's about a female teenage adolescent. So typically, you know, this tends to be a common thing that we get into our uh, office a lot of times. But just to give the background, Samantha is a 16-year-old high school junior who has been exhibiting oppositional defiant behavior. Her parents, Lisa and Mark, divorced when she was 10 years old. The divorce was tumultuous largely due to Mark's arrest and subsequent incarceration for selling drugs when Samantha was eight years old. Since the divorce, Samantha has lived with her mother, Lisa, who works long hours to support the family. Now, right off the bat, a divorce case, right? So, I mean, a case where a child experienced divorce. And when we talk about divorce, very interesting stuff. And actually, um, I think now in the current moment, we're getting a lot of cases in with children dealing with divorce, mm -hmm. divorced uh, parents. And it's a very interesting thing because I guess a question that you can ask here is, is there a certain age where a child struggles more with a divorce or separation of parents compared to a different age? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about it, when uh, parents go through a divorce, when uh, the child is an adult, it's probably a lot more easier for that adult to understand what a divorce and a separation is maybe because they have their own life experiences uh based around you know separations breakups they've probably been in their own relationships where they broke up with someone before mm. however a child has never really experienced that so we kind of have to like be mindful of that right samantha's parents were divorced when she was 10 years old personally me as a mental health counselor in my own experience i feel like the ages of the most struggle with kids going through a divorce are anywhere from like five to 14 years of age, you know, because I feel like kids have a very hard time grasping the idea of a divorce, a separation. You know, there's a lot of complex emotions that go into this fear. Um, definitely fear is the number one thing. Many thoughts such as how am I, how am I going to survive through this? Is, are they going to, is it going to impact financial stuff? Is it going to impact the way I live? Many questions arise from this type of life experience. What do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, I agree with you where you're mm -hmm. saying each developmental phase of a, of a child, of a person mm -hmm. is going to react differently with divorces. Also, it's a case by case thing. You know, mm -hmm. how bad yeah. was the divorce? Was there abuse at home? Right here, dad was in jail, right? So it's an absent parent altogether. Yeah. Are both parents working together and compromising certain things or are the child pulled in the middle that's what we see a lot mm -hmm. right it's it's mom and dad and they're just being pulled in between and one person saying something about the other yeah um, and that usually influences a child it influences a person because then you become biased to one parent over the other and that usually turns out to be some sort of resentment some sort of guilt um, I hear a lot of guilt right like and 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 teenagers and even up to adult feeling like it's their fault like the divorce is their fault if they weren't around then there wouldn't be a divorce right mm -hmm. i haven't really mm -hmm. heard of a healthy divorce yet i don't know if you've worked with or they probably wouldn't be in counseling right <laughs> <laughs> if there was a healthy probably divorce see those, but yeah right. um a healthy divorce what would that look like great question great uh observation i think you know it's something definitely to discuss is like what classifies a healthy mm -hmm. divorce and i think as mental health counselors it's definitely important for us to reach that sort of uh, I goal. idea, or the yeah. goal, like make the divorce healthy. So I guess it's to break down what makes a healthy divorce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I think this case, well, it sounds like our client here is Samantha, mm -hmm. but also our, our clients is the family as well, right? So also having collaborations with the family, yeah. uh, both parents in this case is gonna be very important along with Samantha. You may even recommend some sort of family counseling uh, in addition yeah. to the individual counseling for Samantha. Yeah. And another thing about divorced parents is like, you know, um, just in general, as like a therapist, if you ever work with uh, a divorced family is also understanding the fact that many lawyers are going to get involved. So mm -hmm. be prepared for that paperwork, write your notes, document everything, because that's something that's very important 
in terms of uh, dealing with divorced parents and, and also how their relationship is, you know, because sometimes you get these parents in that are, yeah, separated, but hate each other's guts. Oh, yeah. So then the therapist gets involved in the middle and then yeah. it's like, oh, the therapist said this to the child, mm -hmm. or the therapist said that or this. Mm -hmm. So you just got to document everything. And that's number one ethical code in therapy is to always document everything that sort of goes on in the sessions. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the, you know, everybody kind of says like, Oh, all you do all day is talk to people. That's like an easy job. And it's yeah, like, it's no, it's not. I there's, that. there's so much to go yeah, into yeah. it. Um, so just going back to the case with Samantha real quick. Very interesting case. Uh, basically, the divorce was very hard and rigid because Mark got arrested. So I'm assuming that his incarceration for selling drugs was something that basically kind of made this whole divorce process even harder. Yeah. Right. And, you know, for the parent, for, for um, the mom... I guess Lisa uh, is basically struggling with that as well. And that's something that the child probably, the, the, my question here is, does the child know why dad got arrested? Mm. You know, because sometimes parents withhold that information. Every right, I think, you know, it's hard to tell your child, like, oh, your dad or your mom was arrested for this and this and that, because you don't want to sort of feed that into the child's mm. uh, psych and be like, oh, am I going to be a drug dealer one mm. day? Or am I going to yeah. be a, a murderer? Am I going to be... These type of things, you know, so it's a very uh, interesting thing to just to be mindful of. And that's what yeah. I would ask, too. And mom, is, is she aware of that? I think also the level of contact that Samantha has with the dad, right, is in, in incarceration. Mm -hmm. Do they have phone calls? Do they have visits? Do they have letters? Um, I think also it's important to think about who else is involved in this. Are there families, friends? Like, it takes a tribe to raise a child. Yeah, so who else is involved? It, uh, is Mark's parents involved? Yeah. Right? And Samantha is uh, Lisa's parents involved in yeah. Samantha's life, right? Does Lisa have a, a man in the side or a, a few men? Who knows, right? We're in well, 2024, you know? Yeah. How's, how's her dating game? And yeah. what exposure does Samantha have to Lisa's and, way and, of dating? And how right? much are the phones being used? So many beautiful things to explore right. in the case. And this is why these case-by-case -case episodes are going to be filled with so much interesting facts and like we say like you know it's interesting when other therapists come in and join this kind of conversation and kind of leave a comment on your own viewpoints about yeah. lisa and where she's at in terms of her defiant behavior so let's get into the current situation right, right? so samantha's behavior has become increasingly concerning over the past year she often comes home late at night frequently hangs out with boys and has started smoking weed that's another one. Okay. Recently, Samantha confided in her therapist that she was diagnosed with an STD that requires treatment. She is adamant that her mother not be informed about the diagnosis, fearing her reaction. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of stuff right there in the current mm -hmm. situation, but let's finish it off. Despite her defiant behavior, Samantha is open to seeing a therapist hmm, because she recognizes the negative impact her actions are having on her life. Her grades have been slipping and her social life has been turbulent. She has been the subject of gossip at school, with peers calling her derogatory names. This tension culminated in an incident where Samantha <laughs> punched another girl, resulting in a suspension. Now, Samantha is a bright and sensitive young woman who, despite her current struggles, has potential. She has expressed an interest in becoming a therapist herself one day, wanting to help others navigate their challenges. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the current situation, there's a lot going on here. Mm -hmm. I mean, to basically break it down in, in sessions, I guess, is definitely building rapport with Samantha. Now, just building rapport with teenagers. How do you do that, right? I mean, there's a lot that goes on between behind building rapport with teenagers. You know, it's, it's interesting because... I, I do feel like in our in our generation, like our generation, being millennials and whatnot, we yeah. basically the best um, generation. You haven't the, the best, best generation. The best generation. Yes, you know? yes, we could definitely say yeah. it's the best. One of the best generations. We experienced uh, beepers. We experienced no cell phones. Yeah. We didn't experience, and then we got into. We learned it at an age that's appropriate to learn that sort of technology and utilize it. But um, you know, keeping up with the times is helpful in terms of these type of things. And I know Samantha, you know, you also got to sort of uh, consider the gender differences between, mm -hmm. you know, working with a female adolescent versus a male adolescent. Sure. What are the things going on in between each other's lives and, 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 you know, what are they interested in? Usually with male adolescents, there's more of an interest in like video games, kind of like socializing, maybe certain topics or subjects that they're really interested in and stuff like that. You know, so it really all depends on the person. In terms of the females, you kind of see more 
more of like um, not really that much of an interest in, in video games, more just an interest in like arts or music or other things and other so sorts of hobbies, maybe even sports, whatever the mm -hmm. case is. So I guess just building the rapport by understanding where Samantha is coming from. Also, you know, I do want to say another thing that helps with, you know, and this is just on my own clinical experience based on my own observations. So I'm not saying that I'm not trying to be ageist or anything when I say this, but Usually, you know, as mental health counselors, we are young, you know, like we're kind oh, of yeah. young. We're not older, you know, white hair. Young and hip. <laughs> yeah, young and hip. So, <laughs> you know, like we, 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 we come from like the hip hop era and like the, right. one of the best eras that basically established right. like Life. a really good personality and stuff like that. Yeah, we got the sauce. And yeah, you got the sauce basically <laughs> kind of in a way. But we're, you know, we're, we're down with a lot of stuff and, and we know a lot of things. Yeah. And this new generation, we, we hold a lot of knowledge uh, for them. So... Our age is a plus in this sure. factor. Our generation is a plus. Like millennials sure. working with the young youth, that's actually a very uh, positive thing, I feel like, in terms of building rapport. Yeah. Very similar in terms of like uh, interest and likes and technology enhancements and things like that. Mm -hmm. So this is where you kind of want to think about in terms of building a rapport. Mm -hmm. Now, just going back to Samantha's behavior, smoking weed. I mean, you know, as a therapist, many therapists probably have questions about what do you do when a teenage client or a child client opens up about weed smoking habits? Mm -hmm. Well, you got to assess how often they're doing it and how, you know, where they're doing it and who they're doing it with. So there's a lot of things that you have to kind of assess. However, by law, because Samantha is 16, you know, you don't have to disclose this to the parents, in New York State law at least. Mm -hmm. You don't have to disclose this to the parents unless you feel like the weed smoking habits is causing some sort of mm -hmm. harm mentally to the child. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, okay, like let's say, I mean, I would probably have to break that rapport and like tell the client, hey, like I have to tell this to your parent because it's getting out of hand now. Mm -hmm. if, if, a, if a teenager is smoking weed maybe like uh, four to five times a week, Plus, mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I think like what you were saying before, I think this is where relatability is very important and also like culture, right? Mm -hmm. I think if the older folks who are very conservative and they hear weed, all it is like the same as hearing like a cigarette, right? Yeah. But I think understanding the current day and age, especially in New York City, man, we got weed shops all over the place now. Mm -hmm. It's very, Cultural. I wouldn't say normalized, yeah, but it's very part of the culture here. So I mm -hmm. think, like you said, unless... It is, there are having some severe consequences of it, yeah. you know, smoking on, waking up and smoking, yeah. smoking in the middle of the day, coming back home and smoking every day, every, you know, all day, yeah. then, you know, that's something that is very important for the parents to know. Yes, of course. But, yeah. you know, if it's, a, if it's a social thing, if they're doing it in, especially if they're doing it to help them with their emotions and their behaviors and just help them cope day to day, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's very important for them to confine in us with that information yes. Yes. Uh, without us going back and just like snitching on them. Yeah. Right? Cause that no, could a, it, it could ruin the rapport. It could have even ruined the whole relationship. They could just not pop up. She's 16 years old. She's willingly coming into therapy. So we want to make sure that she continues to feel like this is a safe space where mm -hmm. she can share some of these informations like this because in the future yeah. we also want to know what else is going on right exactly. so like if if we are built uh she's losing that trust you know there's there's no relationship there is yeah. it's, it's gonna go downhill and i definitely have experiences with this in the past like with working when i was like you know when i had my permit and i had my supervisor there's obviously kids that were coming in that would be smoking weed and open up to me about their weed smoking habits and then the supervisor <laughs> She was more, uh, I guess, on the liberal side, mm. and she was just more like, uh, you know, you, you like. I told her, you know, he opened up to me. It was like a, it was like a thirteen year old client, and she and he and he opened up to me that he he was smoking weed, um, uh, you know, like like once or twice a week, mm -hmm. and you know, I told her this, and then she basically came uh, to me and she's like, you have to tell the parents, you got to get them into this drug rehabilitation program and all this stuff. And I'm just like, oh, that's, a, that's a little extreme. Like, you know, like, listen, this is, this is New York City. This is a, a Latino child. Like, you know, trust me, it's not that uh, crazy to kill the rapport. But she was just like telling me you have to do it. 
And I was just like forced to basically kind of like because she was like telling me you have to do it or I'm just taking this case away from you because you're not handling it effectively, you mm -hmm. know. So I'm just like, oh, shit. So I was put in the situation and then I obviously opened up to the kid's uh, guardian at the time. Mm -hmm. And then the guardian, you know, obviously he was upset. He ran out the therapy office all upset, crying, whatever the case is. Never came back. Never mm -hmm. went to that rehabilitation program. Mm -hmm. I learned my lesson. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's to maybe go about it in a different way, and I don't know what you guys think, how yeah. you go about it in a situation in that way, but I wonder what your thoughts are. You know, also what I feel like when teenagers disclose certain things like smoking weed or even the STD, which we'll get to also, yeah. it's like they're waiting to see how you react to it. They're waiting to see like if you're a safe person for them to share these information with, right? <laughs> and I think, again, if we're not... Uh, culturally appropriate in that so we could be just like stuck on the weed oh so weed 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 right and we're forgetting that there's a human in front of us and i think that's such a big thing when i when teens confine in me with some of these information i can tell that they're just like waiting to see if i go oh, whoa weed no way or like have some sort of reaction like other adults in their life yeah and i think part of either like just keeping it cool being stoic or making a you know making light of it yeah i know dre joke. likes to make light yeah, of it I'll be like how much you smoking <laughs> you're rolling like you're smoking a j you're right. hitting the pen like what, what you doing with that you know i right. mean i just i'm very laid back with it i don't give it a problem i mean that, i think that opens the door to have a further discussion about yes, it sir. like if somebody's open up to you, a child, an adolescent open up to you about smoking weed and you're like, oh my God, mm -hmm. you're, you're, that's like, you shouldn't be smoking weed. That's yeah. bad. And you know, the shouldn't, the shouldn't would have That'll make them that's, nervous. Yeah. They'll, they'll fucking, they'll be like, I don't want to talk to this dude right. anymore. What the hell? I'm never going to open up to you about mm -hmm. anything else. Like, no, you got to be chill. You got to be relaxed about it. You just, I mean, me like, okay, you're smoking weed. Why? Like, what's, what's your, what's your reason? Do you understand how it's affecting your development? Let's mm -hmm. talk, let's psychoeducate a little bit. Mm -hmm. Listen, you're, you're 16 years old. You're smoking weed your brain isn't even fully developed yet come mm -hmm. on like mm -hmm. your, your brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 25 did you know that no well now you're learning so yeah. how how is smoking weed going to affect your development and usually that cycle education is good enough to get them to start thinking mm -hmm. because you have to understand teenagers we're talking eric erickson psychosocial stages of development uh, i mean i'm sorry piaget's cognitive stages of development teenagers at this age they're already thinking hypothetically they already have the capacity to say if I smoke this weed, then it's going to affect my brain, and then I don't want that because there's gonna be further consequences mm -hmm. in my future. Now, if we're talking about a 10-year-old smoking weed, oh, forget it, I'm definitely gonna uh, tackle that in a whole different manner. Mm -hmm. Like, and I, I, you know, honestly, I haven't even ever, I don't think I've ever had a client that was 10 years old smoking weed, to be honest with you. I don't think I've, I've ever came across that. But obviously, if it did happen, I would. That's that's a different case. Like, yeah, you gotta tell the parents because that child is thinking more black and white if we're talking cognitive development. You know, they're not really probably thinking hypothetically, if I smoke this, then this is gonna happen, but we'll still try to teach them that, to think that way. All right, what else we got here? So the STD thing. So yeah. just by New York state laws, you know, typically adolescents do have some form of protection in terms of their medical uh, confidentiality. So yes, we as therapists aren't allowed to disclose any sort of medical issues to the parents especially if it's a 16 year old, believe it or not. Um, so that can be confided within the therapist by law, basically, and also even doctors. Mm -hmm. So if an if a, if a adolescent, like a 14 year old by New York state law goes to a doctor and says, look, I got an STD or I'm pregnant, the doctor doesn't have to tell the parents or disclose that information to the parents, mm -hmm. which honestly, I don't know what you guys feel about that. I mean, um, when I wasn't a parent, <laughs> I felt like, great, yeah, awesome. They yeah. should be confidentiality. But then when I turned into a parent, now I'm just like double thinking it. Like, would I want my child not to disclose that she's pregnant if she's 14 mm. and not feel safe enough to tell me that? Yeah. I think it should be the therapist's job to tell, to encourage the parent, the child to, to understand that your parent should be involved in this information. You know, and I think that's what we should probably be trained as to do as therapists in this type of situation. I just think, you know, being a parent, I would want my child's therapist to tell me if my 14 year old daughter is pregnant what do you think about it i think encourage is a good word to use mm -hmm. again i you know i think we're we're fiddling with medical uh you know hipaa and all and all the other protections that teenagers have mm -hmm. um man i'm not a parent myself so i don't have like the bias yeah that's a tough that's a tough one that's a whole other video <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough one. 
I'm going to leave it there with that Well, one. I think, like, not being forced. Like, I don't think the therapist should be forced to say it. But I yeah. think they should be, like, Have trained to encourage yeah. children to open up about this. Because, yes, you can tell the child, oh, yeah, go to Planned Parenthood. They'll give you an abortion or whatever mm. the case is. And, you know, like, if the parent ever found that out, that the therapist told mm. the child, yeah. that, that's coming back to you. So, you're, but you're protected by New York State law to do that, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah, you know? that's so, crazy. So it gets into that's like a whole political uh, yeah. discussion, which is interesting. I wonder what your thoughts are. Oh that. yeah, leave those comments below. Man. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. But yeah. STD. So what STD are we talking about here? Now, very interestingly enough, that's another interesting topic when you work with adolescents. What if it's HIV? Oh, like a serious STD. Yeah. You know, what if it's something like that? Then, you know, obviously as a therapist, you're going to have to learn how to navigate that discussion, yeah, which yeah. becomes complicated because obviously it's a life chronic illness that sure. you just acquired through sexual engagement and sexual mm -hmm. activity, which is not really, uh, you know, great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, but early treatment is better than the exactly, late treatment. Part, exactly. So, so this is I why I guess as a therapist, you should have certain referrals, certain yeah. uh, places that you can send a client to. Uh, work on that more. Maybe, I, you know, I always encourage uh, teenagers to have the discussion with their parents. I'm that type of therapist. So parents, you know, I'm letting you know, I'm the type of therapist that encourages children and your, and your adolescent kids to talk to you about these discussions. I feel like it is important to communicate. Unfortunately, I don't have it in my power by law to force it. So I, I personally encourage it. You know, and I tell the child, like, okay, like, did you tell your parents about this? And did they say no? I'm just like, well, wh what do you think would happen if you did? They would get angry. Okay, so if they get angry, yes, it will pass. I mean, every, every person is a human with emotions. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Uh, but you have a safe space to maybe uh, discuss that here with mm -hmm. them, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll provide that safe space. But it's really up to them. I wouldn't force it on the child, though. I would just, like, talk about it, explore it. Maybe try to encourage it a little bit. If they don't want to, they, they, they're giving me negative feedback. I'll just be like, okay, let's just move forward then. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, it seems like Samantha would be open to some of that. Because, again, she's, she's bright. Here, bright, very willing mm -hmm. uh, to be in therapy. Really is trying to do the work. Yeah. Um, and also wants to be a therapist of herself, right? So I exactly. think we have to enforce how important communication is. Yeah. Which is something that you know we emphasize a lot. Yeah. when it comes to these dynamics like this. Exactly. And so now let's talk about the defiant behavior at school, right? I mean, what is the defiant behavior about? You know, a lot of times when I work with kids with defiant behavior, they always come into the room saying something along the lines like, oh, I'm not that, I'm not a violent person. I'm not an aggressive person and whatnot. And I'm just like trying to understand, okay, so what happened here that you were acting in aggression? Well, in Samantha's case, it seems like there was self-defense. You know, and I think... Uh, you know, from bullying, right? She said that she's been the gossip at school with peers calling her derogatory names, calling her maybe a slut. Mm -hmm. There's probably some sort of cyber bullying going on that's sure. pretty common in today's society with kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being the being the having the spotlight spotlight on you is overwhelming within itself. A lot of times, I feel like uh, children's anxieties manifest into anger or irritability. You know, and sometimes when you work with people with anger issues, you, you recognize that, that a lot of these anger issues that people do suffer with is usually a product of their own anxieties, mm -hmm. you know, because it's not anger really, it's more irritability. Mm -hmm. Like irritability and anger are really correlated with each other, you know what I mean? Like when you're irritable, of course you're gonna react in an angry manner, but I guess in her case, being the gossip at school, being the spotlight, you gotta do what you gotta do. Someone mm -hmm. calls you a slut, what, are you just gonna stand there and let it happen? Or are you gonna defend yourself and, you know, like, make sure it doesn't happen ever again? Mm -hmm. What do you mm -hmm. think? Definitely, you know, her having some sense of control, I think it comes down to, mm -hmm. you know, you, uh, if you're getting pushed around, you're getting bullied, you want to kind of control that, man. You want to, and the only way to kind of stop other people from doing that in this case, you know, it seems like she's fighting back. She's fighting back in some sort of way. So we kind of kind of explore that a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. Like where, where is, what is that doing to her? And, and, you know, what are some other ways and healthier ways for her to address some of these things? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times when it comes to the bullying, it's like they, you don't want to tell adults because then it's like, oh, you went out and you snitched on me and now this person gets mad. It might even escalate 
the bullying. So mm -hmm. again, a case by case thing. Yeah. But we oh, definitely wow. have to address that. Yeah. And it does seem like, you know, once again, Samantha is a bright young woman. She does, uh, you know, express wanting to become a therapist one day. So that ang that situation, I would love to have explored that with her mm -hmm. and see like what, uh, you know, she felt in that moment because it's probably not like her. It was probably something that just came out of her character. Mm -hmm. You know, you also got to understand that Samantha is 16 years old. The personality in a lot of these children aren't really fully developed yet because True. they don't have the experiences or the opportunities to develop their personality. I mean, even when you go like on a personality test, they'll ask you, oh, goes out with, do you, are you the type of person that goes out a lot with a lot of friends? And obviously when you're a teenager, you don't have that freedom to actually do that. You know, I, th I guess a better question is like, would you want to mm. go out and hang out with a lot of friends yeah. in, your own, in your own wants and whatever the case is? But they can't answer those definitively because they wouldn't know even what going out with a lot of friends probably is like right so you know a lot of these personality things are interesting to look at and explore with teenagers because they're just developing it basically in a lot of ways but, okay any other thoughts about the no. current situation let's move on forward all right How so we're gonna help samantha last thing to start start sort of go through our therapeutic goals so with every client this is a very important first session type of scenario always remember you got to create goals why because goals you work it has a template that you can work on every time you come back to the session it's like okay you want to work on your anger issues where are you at with these anger issues now so you keep following up from those goals right so i think some therapeutic goals here that might be beneficial for samantha is definitely to help her understand and manage her emotions mm -hmm. and behavior Usually when I do that with kids, I teach them about something called emotional intelligence. And we keep talking about this and it's definitely a thing that I want to drill into your heads or whatever. But, you know, emotional intelligence is, spilled, is split up between the interpersonal and intrapersonal skills. The self-awareness that you have as an individual and how you socialize with other people. So intra is your self-awareness. Inter is your personal uh, or your social interactions with others, right? So... Talking about that, giving some psychoeducation in that realm could be helpful. How do you do that? You just explore every opportunity. You, you encourage these kids to open up to others. You kind of want to encourage pro-social behavior and not be so cooped up in the house all the time playing Roblox or mm -hmm. Minecraft or Call of Duty or whatever these cases. You want to get out there into the real world and socialize. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that goal? Psychoeducation is great. I think, uh, especially for Samantha, teenagers, I think they appreciate it, right? Because mm -hmm. like uh, what I say all the time is you go to school, you learn mathematics. At home, you learn manners. Who is out there teaching you about emotions, behaviors, feelings, right? Mental health counselors, right? So I think psychoeducation is going to be a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, again, given that Samantha wants to be a therapist one day and she's willingly there, um, let's let's teach her about emotions. Let's teach her how to manage them, how to cope with them. Exactly. Well, you know? And she'll probably love that. She'll probably yeah. be like, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is what I want, I want to go to school for. And I'll be mm -hmm. like, perfect. You're in the right place. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that'd be great. So to improve community, another therapeutic goal that I think is important is to improve communication between Samantha and her mom. Right. And uh, by doing that, it's definitely something that's going to take a lot of work. Collateral sessions is what we call them. Mm -hmm. uh, so you collaborate with the mom and the child and you have those maybe once or twice a month. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Communication is key. Yeah. Communication is key. It's going to be very important for her to start feeling safe, not only in sessions, mm -hmm. but to build that confidence in order to be able to communicate with mom, mm -hmm. be transparent, talk about some of these issues and work through some of these things. So mm -hmm. communication is going to be key. We're definitely going to have to assess her mom, Lisa, Mm -hmm. And, you know, how she shows up yeah. in these dynamics and in conflicts exactly. and yeah. in supporting her overall well-being. Mm -hmm. So, but communication is definitely going to be a key integral part of this. Of course. And then to address, another goal would be to address Samantha's self-esteem and social challenges. Obviously, you know, uh, being diagnosed with an STD mm -hmm. uh, at a very young age can definitely be a big blow to a person's self-esteem and their mm -hmm. confidence when mm -hmm. managing social challenges. Um, you know, I, it, it really also depends on what STD it is. Like if it's a chronic one, like herpes or, um, you know, uh, HIV or whatever the case is, that can be pretty serious. So that's something that you would also have to navigate learning to live with, 
mm-hmm. and go on life with, kind of. Yeah. And all right. And then the last goal would be to support Samantha in achieving her academic and personal goals because it was saying that her grades have been slipping. Mm-hmm. Now, me as a therapist, when it comes to uh, achieving, you know, academic goals and whatnot, I, I kind of use the academics as a monitored progression chart, whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it. I, I, I don't know. I just feel like when, when, when kids at this age like do better in school, it's a very strong indication that they're just doing better in life overall. Yeah, like, that. Uh, like it's, it's cause that's actually, in, if you look in the Diagno- diagnostic statistical manual of mental disorders, all those di- disorders are, mm-hmm. if the child or the person is having a impact to their um, social life, their work life, or their education. Mm. So that's a big one, right? So, I mean, working with kids, this is the beauty of kind of working with kids is that you can monitor their sort of progression in, in life based on their grades to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't overall make the grade progress thing, mm-hmm. the, the whole, oh, use that as like the ultimate template, but it's a good thing to work on. Like if, when I have a client that comes in and the parents are like, yeah, the grades are slipping, He's failing a couple classes. She or he is failing a couple classes. And then by the time we're like halfway through the therapeutic process and we reflect on those grades and their grades have gone up, you know, to me, it's like, okay, you're, you're starting to listen more. You're starting to become more self-disciplined. You're developing self-efficacy. You're actually studying and be learning to become interested in what the school has to offer. You're, 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 you're you know, becoming better. Mm-hmm. And you kind of see that ripple effect in every aspect of their lives. Like you see like, okay, once school starts doing better, better friendships, better self-esteem, better confidence, better, uh, you know, uh, family relationships. Mm-hmm. You see it. It's like a, it's such an interesting phenomenon when it comes to the grades and monitoring that with, with, with adolescents and kids, you know, like and their that. progress and therapy. I like that. So work with the client as a whole, not just as a student. Unless which will have another case by case on ADHD, mm-hmm. unless the goals are associated with ADHD, oh, yeah. and that's something that you have to be, uh, you know, you, I think you have to have that on, se- on a session to session basis because that is the ultimate problem is their ADHD, their school mm-hmm. progress. That, sure. So that's a whole nother case by case. Yeah, yeah. So the approach and the interventions that I would probably utilize in a case like this is definitely some cognitive behavioral therapy, some psychoeducation therapy, family therapy, Mm -hmm. and a strength-based approach in terms of highlighting Samantha's strengths that are actually um, there, all right? So, I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, I love it. I love it. Strength-based, you know, again, she's willingly buying into the therapy. She wants to do the work, and that's where we start, man. Mm -hmm. Shout out to you for even coming in. Yeah. That's step one, and now let's do some work. Exactly. So this is a typical adolescent case that we typically get in. Uh, parents out there that are more interested in working with us because we basically uh, work with cases like this. And if you have a similar case, definitely come by. Hit us up. You know, we're, we're at MindWorks. We're in New York City and we're here making it happen. So let us know. Yes, sir. So we'll, we'll see you on the next case by case. All right. Peace. Peace. Peace.